world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Just a couple of months ago, all of us in Britain were obsessed with party gate uh, with party gate. Uh, who had eaten a cake when? Who had been in the room? Had other things other than cake been absorbed? Had people been drinking alcohol? If so, who with? In December, it looked very likely that this might even be curtains for the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. I said so myself in the pages of The Spectator. I said, it seemed to me that the, the laughter around the Prime Minister had died. And yet, here we are, a couple of months later, and uh, partly perhaps you might say because of the situation in Ukraine and the wider, uh, I suppose, set of uncertainties that have broken out again across the world, uh, somehow the whole party gate thing seems to have slipped down the agenda, perhaps even slipped out of our minds. Should it have done so? Well, this week uh, a second cabinet minister has admitted that lockdown laws were broken during the party gate scandal even after Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, refused to say that they had been. Now, International Trade Secretary Anne-Marie Trevelyan conceded that people who've been referred for fines by police investigating events had, quote, broken the regulations. Now, we know that the police have been handing out fines. Uh, we know that parties took place. I want to bring in the former Labour MP for Ealing North, Stephen Pound, to ask him whether this really needs to still be on our minds, and if so, what are we going to do about it? Stephen Pound, are you with us? I'm um, indeed. Good to see you again. It's haven't um, seen you since uh, the Guildhall uh, during Savile. Absolutely. A great pleasure to hear your voice. Uh, yeah. What do you think, uh, Stephen Pound? Um, sh all, as I say, only a couple of months ago, everyone was saying that Partygate would bring down Boris, and yet... Boris Johnson remains in Downing Street. Should he be? Yeah, well, I, I think he shouldn't be, but the reality is he is. But the, what has also happened is he, he's in the departure lounge. Whatever happens now, and I can understand entirely, in times of crisis, and it's not just Ukraine, obviously it's the cost of living, it's the energy prices, all the other issues mm. going on at the moment. People do not want to actually throw the captain off the bridge You know, when you're in the really, really stormy waters. But the, the real thing here, Douglas, is baked in to his prime ministership now is a complete lack of trust. The point about Partygate was that it's so accessible. People could see, so it's one of these complicated, abstruse political scandals. It's absolutely basic. We locked in. We couldn't see our relatives. We couldn't see our loved ones in hospital. We couldn't visit the old people's homes. We couldn't actually live a normal life. But he and his cohorts were enlarging it, enlarging it up in the Garden of Ten Downing Street. I don't care what you say, that is now baked in, and people just no longer have that trust. Now, you say there's been a, a, a bit of white wine or water under the bridge. There has been, but this will not go away. It will come back, and it will bite him, mm. because it's so obvious, it's so accessible, and it's so absolutely blatant. And when people talk about one rule for them, one rule for us, I've got to tell you, that resonates at every single level of society. I think he's had it. I don't think he will lead the, the, the Tory party at the next election. I certainly don't think he'd win it. And I think that those people who put in the letters to the 1922 committee, um, they have withdrawn them on a temporary basis and they'll be whacking them in again very, very quickly. At the moment, it's perceived as being unpatriotic to be attacking the prime minister. Mm. Very soon, it will be quite the opposite. It'll be patriotic to try to get rid of a man who's brought that office into disrepute and dishonour. So you think they're going to put in the letters, they're going to take them out and put them back in again. It sounds Hokey like cokey, the cokey cokey of politics. But <laughs> I, uh, I, I do agree it sounds possible. But let's just go back a step on this, uh, if we may, uh, Stephen. Um, the, would you agree that it seemed that Downing Street, from the beginning of this uh, rolling out of this story, underestimated public um, anger about this. They seemed to have forgotten, this is how it seemed to me, they seemed to have forgotten that, that this was a hard thing for us to forget because everybody in the country had an experience that was profoundly unsettling at best, for many people absolutely heart-wrenching. I mean, so many people unable to visit loved ones in hospital, you say funerals with hardly any people in attendance and people not allowed to hug their loved ones. You know, do you agree that they, they just seemed to misstep at the beginning of this scandal and not realise the depth of public anger? 
I, I'm fairly familiar with um, what Ken Livingston used to call the lice on the body politic. Those people, the special advisors, the people around Downing Street, they, and this particular, I only know three or four of them, but the one thing they all have in common is an incredible sense of entitlement, a sense of invulnerability, a sense that they can actually do what they want. They thought that they'd got through Barnard Castle and the eye test scandal. And as you rightly pointed out earlier on this evening, two years ago to the day, we were standing outside clapping our hands and clapping our hands and you know ringing the bells well today we're ringing our hands because we now realize that we were fooled we were made to look damn stupid we were made to actually respect and admire the national health service and above all the sacrifice that people were making and while they were making that sacrifice in the health service while we were making that sacrifice at the home front they were sloshing back the white wine in the garden of downing street i don't care what you say there's no getting away from that people understand that and people are damned angry about it and they still will be at the moment at the moment absolutely right you know he's got a break in play you know we're at half time but when the second half is over the chickens are going to come home to roost with a fluttering flapping vengeance in my opinion. Now, now you, you were you were in politics for for, for a good long time, and uh, you've seen uh, governments go up and down. Uh, you've seen scandals come and go. Um, do you think there's any prospect when a when a government gets a scandal of this magnitude? And first of all, by the way, it'd be interesting to know if you can think of anything in your own political uh, career, uh, any government that has gone through something similar. And secondly. When they do go through this, you know, is, is there ever a way back? Is there ever a way to regain public trust? Well, in, in my political life, there have been two occasions. Um, one was in, in 1996-97, the dying days of the major government with all the sleaze and the, some of the most egregious behaviour that was mm. being displayed by various MPs. We could see that the writing was on the wall there. We could see only the murally dyslexic couldn't see what was on the wall there. And the other one was in, in 2008 when Gordon Brown took over. And we had all the scandal, you know, with the, uh, the poor woman up in Rochdale and various other things. We knew that... Uh, in, Gillian well, Duffy, I, yeah. Well, indeed, well, Gillian Duffy, indeed. I just, you know... I still weep for that woman, but all of us knew that we were sitting there in Parliament waiting for the Etonians. We knew that they would be arriving in their ponies and traps and their horse and carriage with their top hats. You know, <laughs> we, knew, we knew that they were coming. We could see them coming over the hill. Bentleys, Rolls Royces, you name it. We knew that we were absolutely <laughs> fryer tucked. Well, there was no way out of it. We were stuffed. And so it didn't matter what we did. Mm -hmm. And Gordon did some really good things. And he made, towards the end of that campaign, towards as we got into the 2010 election, he made these brilliant speeches, these great earth-shattering speeches didn't do any damn good because the public had made up their mind they baked it into their a conclusion and their assumption we knew that we would absolutely stuff them boris johnson in his heart of hearts knows that he's been teflon so far he's got away with lying and lying and lying he's got away with some of the most appallingly promiscuous behavior not just in in that sense but in the general sense and he's reached the end of the road. The public don't trust him anymore. One or two of them might like him. They might think he's a bit of a character, you know, a bit of a joker, might be a nice bloke to have a pint with. But do we want a man in a time of crisis? And don't forget, we're looking at a 9% inflation. We're going to get walloped yeah. in this country, in, in the economy. Do we really want a man like that? No, Jeremy Hunt should be dusting off his... Uh, prime ministerial tie and heading for Downing Street because they will get somebody who is the antithesis of Boris Johnson and you know, my feeling it gives me no pleasure to say this whatsoever but I think somebody like Jeremy Hunt could actually rescue the Tory brand which has been demeaned and debased by this charlatan that is currently the prime minister has to say one always has to add a slight disclaimer when a Labour MP or a former Labour MP <laughs> advises the Conservative Party on who to get as a leader right, right. Uh, because there's always a possibility. <laughs> I'm, I'm a patriot first. Most... Right? I'm a, a citizen of this country. I'm a patriot long before, you know, but I, I'm a Labour hack second. And, you know, I want this country. Do you honestly mm. think I'd, I'd want to see this country suffer and my party not? As far as I'm concerned, country yeah, first, right. party second. Quite right. We've only got a few seconds. But Boris Johnson, of course, himself once said about a previous prime minister that at this stage, the only two things open are to for the prime minister to be able to s sort of save a drowning child in a pond or perhaps for the Argentinians to invade the Falkland Islands again. The Argentinians have not uh, invaded the Falkland Islands, but Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, only 20 seconds, uh, Stephen Pound. Do you think there's any uh, way in which the war in Ukraine gets him out of this? 
Absolutely not. Zelensky has been very, very complimentary about him. But there's a, we're not sending a task force to Kiev and Lvov to actually rescue the Ukrainians. We're providing what assistance we can. This will not save him. This will not save his bacon. And if I was a child hanging around near the edge of a pond or a lake or the Thames at the moment, I'd look over my shoulder and make sure that there wasn't a large, blood and figure barreling down towards you to nudge you in and then rescue you. What? Thank you very much for being with us. Good talk. Hot talk. Talk. Bold talk. talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio.